like, why am I in this business? I think there's a, a way to create real global impact in a highly fraudulent category um, and yep. bring you know some stability to, to an industry that's been destabilized by fraud. Like if we have a we have a villain in our story, it's honey fraud, and it's what causes all the rest. It's what causes price deflation. It's what causes downward pressure on producers. It's what th those producers then have to have more poor beekeeping practices. They get dependent on things like pollination services. It's just, it's all coming from the fraud and then the consumers, you know, demand for cheaper, 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 cheaper. This is Evolve CPG, a community of purpose-driven brand leaders who not only believe in better, but actively pursue it. As better products, better brands, and better leadership for a better world. Join our online community where we're going further, faster, together at community.evolvecpg.com. I'm your host, Gage Mitchell, founder and creative director of Modern Species, a sustainable brand design agency helping better brands grow and scale their impact. On this episode, we're speaking with Douglas Raggio, founder of Pass the Honey, about understanding your biases and blind spots and the necessity of being in it for the long haul when you're trying to change the system. I'm Douglas Raggio, founder of Pass the Honey, I guess a quasi CPG vet in the industry about 16 years, uh, venture capitalist, private equity fund manager, now founder, um, just wrote a book um, about starting a food company, it's a choose your own adventure book, so got my hand on a lot of things. That's awesome. Well, I'm excited to chat with you some more about the book as well as um, the company you founded, but first I want to talk a little bit like about where I'm guessing a lot of the inspiration from the book came from, which is uh, you have a consulting practice called Bias and Blind Spots, and you've been helping a lot of people kind of understand what they're not seeing when they're getting ready to invest in a company or start a company or something. So let's talk about some of those bias and blind spots. I know just pre pre converse or pre recording here, we we're talking a little bit about like relationships as an example. But what are some of the key themes you talk about in that book? The book and bias and blind spots. Bias and blind spots is a number of things. It, it's consulting, it's investments, it's fund management. Um, yeah, it, it's kind of my bucket to catch all. And a lot of things that I run contrarian. I, I don't think opportunity, you know, lies in the mass channel, like in the, you know, where everyone's running. Um, it gets very costly and very exhausting. And I'd much rather pick my own lane and, you know, have a moderate success with less stress. <laughs> Um, yeah. so the, a lot of times like, you know, the book is called, so you want to start a food or beverage business. And that really was my second sentence after a friend or a person in a cowork comes to me and says, Hey, I want to start this business. Can I ask you a question? I'm like, Oh, so you want to start a food or beverage business? Like, Oh, what you don't know. Um, <laughs> and it's, it, the, the barriers of entry for food are perceivably really low. You have a great product that tastes great. All your friends and family tell you it's great. Maybe you started selling at a farmer's market. You're getting feedback there that it's great. You're like, I'm going to make a run at this. There's a lot more. There's margins and distributors and brokers and retailer margins and discounts and promos and chargebacks. And, you know, then you have expiring goods and co-packers and production schedules and, you know, the litany of things in between. And now, you know, coming off the end of COVID and now a global conflict, we're all very familiar with supply chain and, you know, the, the <laughs> premiums on trucking and transport and pallet costs and where wheat comes from. You know, I don't think Americans knew that wheat came from Ukraine. Um, yeah. So, yeah, it's those it is a incredibly complex industry, perceivably simple, definitely not easy. And that was my intention with bias and blind spots as a whole. And how I like to look at life is that just no, no, try to find what you don't know as soon as you can. Um, where aren't you looking? What are the right questions to be asking? You know, just because your competitor does X, Y, Z, does that mean you need to go do X, Y, Z? Most times, no. You know, taking venture capital yeah. does not mean that you have to take venture capital just because they took it. They have entered a different game. You know, it depends on what your end game is. Um, yeah. And that's what the book is structured as a, a pick your path. So if you remember those old choose your own adventure books, yep. you read a little yep. bit of pages, you pick a, pick a direction, so I also thought that some critical thinking and accountability was lacking um, in society. 
So you know, having to stop and make a decision with partial information and choose a pathway is literally how I think every founder runs a business. You're making the best decisions with the best information you have to the best of your ability, given your experience. And that's all you can do on a day in, day out basis. Um, no one has a crystal ball. Um, there is no one way to do something. So that's where the book has this ability to pick an archetype. It's kind of just like the four basic founders I've seen as, you know, as a fund manager of venture capital, you know, kind of vetting deals. There's a consistency in the types of founders we see in the space. Yeah. And so a reader can pick one of those. It maybe resonates more with them and then they get to run the path. And, you know, spoiler alert, it's a bunch of dead ends, just like businesses. <laughs> you know, yeah, it gets totally. certain, gets a certain way down the path and then it just like, it pitters out or, you know, the customers didn't buy it or you couldn't get the right price or you weren't capitalized enough or you were capitalized too much. Um, yeah, it's somebody called it a dream crusher. Uh, <laughs> I think it's an eyes wide open book. It's, yeah. Just, you know, again, it, think it through. And what is your back to bias and blind spots as kind of an ethos? What is your end game? Like, Gage, what do you want out of life? And just build towards that. You know, don't get pulled off your path because somebody else did something different because they have a different end game than you. And yeah. that's what I, you know, with Pass the Honey, I constantly have to reimagine, you know, what company, what business are we in? What do we want to do? And let's build towards that. And I still get caught. I thought, my own, you know, ego and arrogance was I've looked at 1,200 deals. I've invested in, you know, a dozen companies. I'm going to miss all the problems. Like, I know where all the, the bodies are buried, as they say. Yeah, nope. There's always I'm in more. all the same problems with Pass the Honey. No, but I'm, I'm in the same. I'm getting cash flow pinched like everyone else. Um, you know, we're having pushback on margin and we're, you know, how to get displayed in retail. All the same shit that every, you know, pardon my French, all the same stuff that other founders go through. I'm not exempt from it. It's the industry. And it's yeah. bigger than me. It's bigger than you. So and that's the thing that's is what, even though you know of those obstacles, you're still going to hit them. And it's oh yeah, hitting them with the knowledge that they're coming and what you can do about it rather than hitting them blind and <laughs> just yeah. running yeah, into it and bit, letting yeah. it knock you out, sure. right? <laughs> they still don't feel good. I yeah. still hate running out of cash every month. Like it's just like ah, you start to get real myopic when you know you, all of a sudden you get this huge order that comes in. It's like okay, yeah. We'll fulfill it, but how do you build the inventory? You know, cash flow is, really? is the that is the the rope cash you is hang king, right? With. That's it what is they king, say. And it is also the biggest stumbling block. Yeah. Do you even do you have the resources? Do we have the bodies to support a large retail account? Yeah. Right now, no. So you tell them no, and that sucks because you need the cash to grow the business, to hire the staff, to service the account that you just told no to. So yeah. That's the For kind sure. of daily struggles you're making as a as a founder in general, I think. But CPG has a a little bit more complexity due to the you know the retailer, the distributors, the brokers. There's limited shelf space in the retailer, and if you're doing D to C, yep. that's not a fun endeavor right now because ad costs are through the roof. Yep. So, yeah, I feel like you know starting a business in general is a huge undertaking, right? I can't remember the percentages, but it's like something to the effect of like 80% of all small businesses are close their doors within like three to five years or something like that. It's, it's oh, yeah. pretty, pretty drastic. And then there are industries that are even harder. Like let's just say restaurants or something. It's probably more oh, yeah. like 99% of them. Yep. Um, but like CPG, like you're saying, there's so many things that look easy on the outside. <laughs> like a lot of people start a CBG company because they're like, oh, I made this thing at home or I have this idea or whatever. But they're not thinking of all those complexities, some of the ones that you outlined. And and that if they're diving in blind, like you're saying, they're going to take so much longer to get anywhere because they're going to be stepping on every mine in the field. Whereas yeah. if you at least understand what you're getting into going ahead, you might still step on some of those mines, but you'll know that you're going to step on mines, right? Yeah. And you'll be kind of more prepared for it. And you know, the, if you go back to the end game, you know, I'm, I'm never worried about past the honey's long-term success. Like it is my life's work. I sometimes get worried about, you know, next week's payroll, but <laughs> yeah. the, the future, like that, like that's the stuff that just, but like, you know, what the end game is, this whole team knows what we're working towards, we're working towards changing the honey industry, reclaiming honey. Um, there's there's a bigger vision and a bigger purpose that you know you, you lace up for every day, um, even when you know that the lumps are coming or the uncertainty or the when is a PO or when's a PO going to be paid? You know when you actually receive funds that 
that's always a gap that you don't know. Yeah. Um, let me ask you this. We had talked earlier. A lot of food founders, there is a, a general consensus. And I, this is my question. Is I don't know if that consensus is correct or not. So I'm asking you. A lot of founders get into food to change the food system to you know either heal the earth or heal the people. This broader purpose. I don't know if that statement or that assumption holds water when you walk the aisles of just recently Expo West, right? And there's, this was the year of alkaline water or water. <laughs> yeah. And last year was the like plant-based jerky. Like, how are you, does that, does that statement of food and beverage founders are in it for better health, better ecosystems when the majority of new brands are iterative in cluttered categories? Like how much is a pile on effect an opportunistic launch versus a purpose launch? And I don't think that I think it's I think the original statement doesn't hold. Yeah, I think it's a bit of both, right? Like some founders are literally in it for the purpose and they're willing to pivot to whatever will help them fulfill that purpose. Like one of our long term mm -hmm. clients, Alter Eco, they started yeah. just trying to provide a market for chocolate growers so they can have uh or for various growers, rice, quinoa, et cetera. Um, and they started out just selling the rice and quinoa, just kind of commodity based, but like with, with the organic certification, with fair trade, all that kind of stuff. And their core purpose was really just to provide access to the market so that these farmers can get fair pay and so that people can get better quality products instead of just, um, crappy versions of them that have been bred just to be cheap or easy to grow. Yep. Um, so they started there, but then as other quinoa and rice and other companies started coming up and cutting into that market share, they realized, well, maybe we need to pivot it a little bit into something else. So they started launching chocolate and then that started doing well and they were able to help those chocolate farmers. And then they realized, wait a minute, these chocolate farmers could use better farming practices. And look at this example over here of agroforestry. Oh, maybe we should actually start a foundation and help other farms convert to agroforestry. And it's, and next thing you know, they're almost all entirely a chocolate company. <laughs> so it's like, they started purely to just help these farmers and the product itself was just an outcome of what can we do to help these farmers. Yeah. So I think there are companies like that that are like pure mission based and then they figure out the product that will best fit that mission and create revenue and provide rev or provide income for those farmers and so on and so forth. And then absolutely, I think there's totally a bunch of entrepreneurs who just want to start a business and they're looking for market trends like what's hot right now or where's there a gap in the market and some of them maybe have a mission some of them don't some of them might just be doing what's hot like oh everyone wants plant-based jerky so i'm going to make a plant-based jerky and it's not their mission to like reduce carbon of animal industry or whatever they're just seeing it as something hot um, but sometimes those people who are just finding an interesting product, they do still attach a mission to it after the fact, like it wasn't the main point, right? But they're like, because it's marketable. Yeah. They're like, okay, you know what? I really want to do, start a business. This seems like an area that has a lot of potential. And now I'm going to say, you know what, what can we do to make sure this company is responsible and how can we reduce our footprint or how can we have sustainable packaging or how can we give back or something like that? So percentage wise how many businesses in cpg you think are in that purpose that core purpose bucket oh that's a good question i my just gut instinct would be like 10 20 percent something like that max i was gonna go five to ten okay so so we agree on 10 maybe you know, i was going a little more okay yeah yeah 10 i mean that's even it's just yeah it's it's fascinating watching all the money in the space and how that changes things absolutely yeah i don't say mo money doesn't it doesn't corrupt i mean it's you know is that whatever that quote is but it's fascinating watching this industry explode the way it has and if you've been around since the beginning of alter ego you've been around to see these like cycles and to watch you know, companies go from nothing to something and a lot of times from something to nothing um and maybe starting to see that in a lot of the plant-based you know ipos that are really panning out as 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 hyped yeah. So yeah, it's you know, to have a company like Pass the Honey that is truly, I mean, it's disproportionately at this point purpose driven, um, building a global supply chain of unadulterated regenerative honey to give fair, you know, wages to beekeepers and educating on best bee practices and partnering with institutions and having a million acres in the U.S. for research. Like 
to hear other brands say save the bees and get away with it <laughs> is just infuriating yeah to me. totally i think that like, what do you mean save the bees it, yeah a lot of those save the bees badges or whatever that i see on brands I, I feel like to your point they're doing that just because it's marketable right like it's it maybe maybe it's because sure. they know that that'll help their supply chain because without the bees they won't have their product anymore but it's also like Oh, everyone's interested in bees right now. I better get on, jump on this bandwagon and put the Save the Bees badge on there. Or some ancillary thing that doesn't truly help the bees, just raises awareness for bee work. But then when we peel back the layers, there's very few people doing actual pollinator research. Yeah. Which is you know, all that talk. You know, the fact that our little tiny companies having to do as much as we do is, I think I've said the statement, like we're doing the work that other people should be. But because they're not, we have yeah. to. And that's incredibly costly um, for a little company. And then you have to justify it to the consumers that why do we cost more? Well, we cost more because we're regeneratively sourced. We cost more because we're unadulterated. We cost more because we fair, we pay fairer wages. We cost more because we fund research and habitat restoration. You know, we cost more because we do more and we do more because we cost more. Yeah. Those are mutually, you know, dependent on each other. And I'm wearing a Patagonia jacket. There's plenty of places to get a cheaper jacket. But I trust that Patagonia is a better steward of my of my money and my you know our earth than its competitor. Yeah. There there is a trade off, and a lot of times that comes down to yeah. Cost. And I think part of it's that consumers aren't used to actually paying the real price for things. They're paying prices that are oh, either I subsidized know. by governments or they're paying prices that are um, artificially low because there's you know, a garbage supply chain where they're underpaying people or putting them in unsafe conditions or they're buying a really bad product and like, and giving you, feeding you something that maybe tastes good or like feels good at mo at, the, at first, but like it breaks down or it doesn't have nutrition or whatever in it. So I think part of it's just like, this is the real cost mm. of business and people aren't used to paying that. And the other part of it is, yeah, the other part of it is this, like this, purpose tax uh, for lack of a better term which is when you're trying to do things the right way you're going to be you're going to have to pay extra to verify your supply chain you're going to have to pay extra to get b corp certified oh, yeah. you're going to have to pay extra to be organic or regenerative certified you're going to have to pay extra to do all the research that the industry should have done a long time ago to verify like the quality of the product or to test for uh, glyphosate or whatever and there's all these taxes that add up that the mainstream non-purpose driven products don't have to pay <laughs> which is just kind of weird because wow. you have to pay all this extra money to do the right thing but to do the wrong thing you get all these subsidies and tax breaks oh. and whatever yeah. else it's just broken right back to said infuriating yeah. so do you think so you mentioned organic certifications and I, and I i need to keep saying this out in public I don't know if you, if you realize it, but there is no organic certification for honey. There is no standards and practices in the USDA organic certification guide for honey because you cannot qualify the six miles that a yeah, bee flies. don't know where they go. Or the bioaccumulation from pesticide drift or you know what, like anything else. And so the fact that there's no standards and practices for organic certification of honey in the U.S., but yet there's honey you know, labeled organic due to a lack of enforcement and a gray area due to reciprocity rights with other organic certifiers that also don't have controls is just like what I don't and to be told by a retailer that they only carry organic honey you know, like you, you're a retailer you should know this like if you're if you're setting that standard you should probably know that honey is a weird one and that we're setting regenerative standards which are above organic and we have UC Davis and we have the research to actually back up these claims like I don't know who else is doing more Man, no, you need organic certs. You're, I'm done here. I can't have this conversation yeah. any longer. But that's the kind of stuff. It's like how, to do the right thing and do it right. I still get pushed back from people that say they want the right yeah. thing. So it's just, you know, honey is its own little anomaly. It never would have guessed it has as many weird nuances. I feel like every thing. industry probably has a whole, you know, like you see the tip of the iceberg. And then when you start working in the industry, you see oh, everything yeah. below it. Like one of our previous guests, um, who founded a company called Riff, he was kind of building out a coffee company. And then when he went around to tour some of the, the farms that were growing his coffee, he realized there's a giant pile of waste over there. What is that? And it's all the fruit that they you know peel away from the coffee bean that oh, right. has very little use. So they just throw it in a pile and it 
you know, ferments and create leaches, toxins, and like, you know, in small quantities, it's probably fine. But on these giant coffee farms, it ends up destroying yeah. the environment. And it's just a bunch of wasted stuff that's actually good for you. It's got a lot, a lot of nutrients and kind of a nice sweetener and has some energy and whatever. So he ended up pivoting a little bit into energy drinks um, based off of that cascara, the, the fruit around the coffee, just to try oh, to yeah. bring that um, to awareness of this like giant untold story about the massive waste in the coffee industry. I've also talked to people in the honey field who who go into coffee plantations or whatever they're called, fields, farms, whatever, and uh, put in beehives and stuff in there because it's great conditions for the bees, but also great for the, the farm. And it creates like a good story around um, coffee. But there's just like so many different layers and to every different product that once you dig in, you're going to uncover so much that you never would have thought of. And maybe it'll create some op- awesome innovation opportunities, or maybe you're just going to be banging your head against the wall because well, yeah. things like organic certification. No, no, there, there's <laughs> always opportunities. It's, uh, it's just yeah. slow. That's, you know, all that stuff with, you know, waste and efficiencies. And yeah, I was reading, I don't know if it was Wall Street Journal or something, I was saying that like, after COVID, after the, the Suez Canal being blocked, after, you know, the Ukraine you know, war, um, that like globalization is, is limited now. Like, like coming back to, you know, we built for efficiency, we didn't build for stability. And now things are unstable, which is, you know, causing problems and ripple effect in numerous different ways. So that this concept of really regionalizing our food sources again is becoming more important, which I find amazing. I mean, we're, to your point about working with beekeepers in, in uh, coffee fields, we work with tea plantations to put beehives there. And it's a secondary source of income that also rehabilitates yeah. the ecosystem. So like, it, the ironic part with our product being honeycomb is that it's the source. Like liquid honey is a byproduct of honeycomb. Liquid honey is a processed food. It gets heated and blended and jarred. Um, we are the, we're the banana. Like we are the actual item. We're the apple. We're the berry. Um, and to be able to have that in a manner that is creates like our best product comes from the best ecosystems. Like we get the best tasting honey from them in diverse ecosystems. So our real job is not to manufacture, process, design anything. It's to make these crazy diverse ecosystems, which is just native habitat, which is why we have the million acres for restoration, habitat restoration in the U.S. And it's a super... I love it. Like it is the simplest product. It is pure, like as pure as you can get a bee pollinated flowers, put it into a cell and then it's finally getting in your mouth. Like not a man or machine touched it. And, uh, I love that fact that we don't have to, like we have a two foot square that has a six mile positivity radius of ecological diversity, which sequesters carbon. Like it's just, it's a weird one that just is yeah. fascinating. Uh, but then you get like, like you were saying, like, you get these like interesting partnerships that come out of nowhere. You're like, Oh, who wants to work with us or what's their interest? Like, okay, like large timber groups. Okay, that makes sense. We can we can heal fire damage, the forest fires, by bringing beehives, uh-huh. managed hives, and actually pulling in the pollen into the actual, you know, deforested, burned area. And we can identify what pioneer species of of Laura um, is, is the first ones to come out. And then we can actually you know, catalyze that more to rehabilitate the landscape. Yeah. Never would have thought. That we'd be using, you know, managed hives to regenerate, you know, forest fire. That that's crazy, but that's what yeah. these do. They so, regenerate. do you feel like you're actually selling honey, or are you yeah. selling regenerated ecosystems? Because <laughs> to some degree, regenerated ecosystems is what you're doing. It just happens to be the, pr- yeah, because it's, it's sort of like Alter Eco. Yeah, it's like Alter Eco, right? They're making chocolate to help the farmers and to convert to agroforestry and whatever. They're not necessarily in it to make chocolate. That just happens to be the thing that'll help them do their work. You are, Alter Ego has been something like a hero. Like I love following that story and even how they yeah. even finance themselves. You know, a hundred year fund getting behind you. Like that's the time period that we have to work on. And uh, you're 100% correct. Like Honeycomb is just our wedge. It is a way to communicate to the customers and have a different relationship to honey, to re-educate around honey fraud, best practices, regenerative agriculture, the roles bees play in our food system. Like the, the honeycomb allows us to have a different engagement. 
And but really what's behind it to your iceberg comment is this robust supply chain effort to set global standards for regenerative apiculture, educate global producers, pay better, um, and then have a full chain of custody so that the fraudsters don't get their hands on our unadulterated regenerative product because honey is the third most fraudulent fruit on the planet. Like 70% of all liquid honey is blended and heated with processed syrups and sugars that the customer has no awareness of. So like it's just, yeah, it becomes this complex thing. But yeah, ultimately we're creating the first fully independent regenerative source of honeycomb and liquid honey yeah. and wax in the world. And that is a... It's a commodities play. It's a regenerative systems play. Yeah. It's not a honeycomb play, but the honeycomb is our conduit to the consumer to say, "Hey, this is different." Yeah. Let us and tell you the, why. there's a lot of consumer education that goes into that, right? Because right now, most consumers think whatever comes in that yeah. little teddy bear is is honey, right? And then the more educated you get, you're like, "Okay, well, maybe if I just get some local honey or this or whatever," and then you start learning a little bit more, but. I, I read some stat and I can't remember the exact stat, but it was something like a staggering percentage of honey that's on the market could barely even be qualified as honey anymore if you like actually tested the product because of how yeah, how processed over, it is, over 70%. Or, or maybe a lot of the honey is actually just a bunch of corn syrup or something like that, right? That that they sell as honey, rice yeah, syrup. It's rice syrup. It's just crazy. Like the consumers have no idea. So that'll be you know one of the struggles Zero. is you're solving a problem that people don't know exists, right? Which is a challenge. <laughs> but luckily, you can solve that while selling them a delicious product. We are product. <laughs> going through that right now. Yeah, it is It is still sugar. Um, a healthy sugar that doesn't spike and crash. But yeah, you're, you being your background with modern species, like you get it. Like we're also a commodity, right? So there is no core demographic. There is no core use. It's the, the, the history of the banana at the turn of the century and where we're at with honeycomb and where mangoes were 10 years ago even. Like I just read that mangoes are the number oh, one wow. fruit in America right now. Growing at like 20%. That sounds unsustainable. No clue. <laughs> Do we um, even grow any mangoes in anywhere but maybe yeah. Hawaii? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. It was it was in produce business or produce news, one of the two that I get. And uh, Yeah, it's like you go into this, how do you tell that story? There's education from the consumer. There's education for the buyers. Where do you put honeycomb in the store? It doesn't really go by the teddy bear. You know, so we actually are distributed through produce. We're an agricultural good. Mm. You know, we don't even need, I don't think, a nutritional panel. I'm looking into that because I can't tell you how many calories are in each cut of comb because it varies just like the calories in a banana and orange depend on size. Yeah. You know, it's, there's all these weird anomalies that when you, when you, like I've had to unwind my CPG brain <laughs> and learn agricultural commodities and produce, which is a, just a different, it's a different set in the store with different expectations and different sell-ins and yeah it's it's different this this product is not what it's what it's yeah so from a purpose point and from a mechanic it sounds like there's some things that still cut you off guard right even though even though you know so much about the industry and and you've done all this consulting work to help other people uncover blind spots but even like what you just said right there like you're not you have to Un unwind or kind of unlearn your CPG brain so you can like think about it, uh, this business in a different way. So I'm, I'm curious, which, which of the lessons, um, from kind of all your research and from your book, maybe did you know you were going to have to deal with, with, with this company? And then which ones just kind of like popped up that you hadn't even thought of? I did not realize that. Most American consumers don't know what honeycomb is. Okay. We get asked on a weekly basis, how did you get the honey in there? <laughs> what? <laughs> so I thought you made made the combs and pumped the honey into it or something. <laughs> okay. I don't know. I'm trying to figure out how to make this marketable and not come off as a total jerk. <laughs> but that's like that level of unawareness of where honey comes from is probably indicative of the general consumer not knowing where food comes from. Um, but that, I, I just figured, oh, it's honeycomb. It's cut single serve. Like, I think I would just, it would fly off shelves. It does fly off shelves when we get it there. But just the sheer fact of getting it in front of, like right now, we distribute through produce. Did not expect that. And they told me, you don't need a nutrition panel. You don't need a UPC. You're an agricultural good. You go by weight. You need a, a, a PLU, price lookup, just like an apple. Like, oh, that's really interesting. 
I never thought of it like that because I've been thinking CPG. And I've been thinking demographics and uses and claims. Well, you can't make claims. It's a, it's a food item and it's a source food item. It's a commodity. Um, so that was like my first unlock. And then, you know, we sell through produce because we don't expire. We are an agricultural good. We're regeneratively sourced. So we have a commitment to regenerative agriculture. We have a commitment to pollinators, which is, you know, pollinates two thirds of the produce set. Um, so like we are firmly in produce, but yet the produce buyer gets interested and then we get kind of stolen by the grocery buyer mm, interesting. because that's who buys honey. It's like, well, we're not liquid honey. And then I didn't expect that, that, and then Delhi gets a hold of it because they get, they catch wind and they're like, well, we have charcuterie. So like we get bounced between these buyer groups yeah. because honeycomb goes in one, goes through one buyer, but we're not that like. Honey has been classified as an other category of liquid honey from a commodities perspective, Interesting. which is makes no sense. When I asked the, the Department of Commerce, I said, why is that? And they said it's because honey, liquid honey is the bigger category. And I go, but you don't say apples are other of apple juice. <laughs> so why, like liquid honey comes from honeycomb. How does it sit below in your coding system? Like that, it, 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 you're supposed to be yeah. logical. You know, it should be honeycomb and then byproducts, liquid honey and wax, wax for cosmetics, but like, or candles. It's yeah. Like those are the things that just, I'm like, what? And then it just causes confusion throughout. So we're out, we're charting unknown territory. Yeah. And I just think it's because nobody's been able to understand like how people ask, how do you eat honeycomb? Well, you just chew it. You eat whole wax? Yeah. Yeah. That, that was done before it was yeah. in the teddy bear. You just chewed the wax. The original gum. Um, I don't know. It's, and then the other frustrating thing is that the customer, to your point about price, the, you know, most customers have been conditioned to pay nothing for honey, like take it at a coffee shop yeah. free. Um, and there is a cost. There is a cost to beekeepers. There is a cost to ecosystems that is unseen. Um, and when you come in with something that has a real price, it, there is a sticker shock. And so to, educate those consumers and have them kind of carry our story on has also been like why has this been so difficult it shouldn't i didn't think that it would be that yeah i feel hard. like that's the challenge one of the challenges um, of whenever you're sort of inventing a new category so to speak like not that honeycomb didn't exist before but like similar to from yeah, pat from chapul move. right when he was trying to sort of invent the cricket protein market. There's just so much confusion, even just around, like you were saying, like retail stores or, or legal kind of um, classifications and different things. Like I remember him saying that he had to do a lot of back and forth fighting with, I think it was Whole Foods, to get them to ever even carry the product because it wasn't on a list of improve, approved ingredients. It wasn't on a list of not approved ingredients. It was yeah. just in no man's land. So like it was so new to the That's, U.S. Yeah. Uh, food chain that he had to work to even get it on any lists and then make sure it could get approved. And there was just all that education, not to mention consumers, like you're saying, with the wax of your honey, um, where it should be common sense and probably was common sense 30 years ago or something like that or 40 years ago or whatever before yeah, it was before teddy bear honey. Um, but same thing with like crickets, like it's. Like in a lot of countries, this is super common, but for consumers in the U S they're like, what you want me to eat bugs? That's weird. You know? So like whenever yeah. you're starting something new like that, you kind of have to be in it for the long haul because you might be 10, 20 years ahead of the, the consumer industry trends. Right. But like whether it's hemp or CBD or, you know, any of these kind of things that have taken a long time to build up, like it theoretically will eventually come around but it might take you 10, 20 years until the, like the culture shifts enough to, for you to be the hot new product. Like mushrooms are going in everything now. <laughs> yeah. 20, 40 year overnight success. The overnight success. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Well, I and mean, that's where we, we, we go back to knowing why you're in it, right? Like, why am I in this business? I think there's a, a way to create real global impact in a highly fraudulent category. Um, and yep. bring, you know, some stability to, to an industry that's been destabilized by fraud. Like if we have a, we have a villain in our story, it's honey fraud. 
And it's what causes all the rest. It's what causes price deflation. It's what causes downward pressure on producers. It's what th those producers then have to have more poor beekeeping practices. They get dependent on things like pollination services. It's just, it's all coming from the fraud and then the consumers, you know, demand for cheaper, 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 cheaper. So yes. Yeah. How do you tell the consumer that they're part of the problem? Like I'm yeah, part of the problem totally. in, in, in certain decisions. We all vote with our wallets. So, yeah. Yeah. So as an investor, if two proposals come, come to you, one of them's not truly purpose driven, but they're willing to do things the right way, um, for the most part, but it's a already a hot product category and, and they can kind of just be something of a me too, but with a twist, like maybe they're making, let's just say a cheese puff that happens to be gluten free or whatever. I don't know. Something Pass. that like, you know, people already Pass. want. You know, people already want it. And you know, there's a market for it Pass. versus <laughs> versus someone like, you know, pass the honey. Whereas like this, this could take a really long time to come to fruition because we've got all the odds stacked against us. Consumers don't even know they want this thing. They don't even know why it's better, et cetera. Grocery stores don't even know where to put it. But it's truly mission based. It's truly built upon the passion of the founder and so on and so forth. But your investment might take. 20 years to pay off like as an investor like which one of those i, I think you already said pass on the first yeah, one. So, so i think i know your answer but like how do you break those apart because i think most investors are going to say okay this other company we can scale it to 50 million in two years and then sell it and whether or not it dies after that because it was just this passing trend or something like that and there was no true passion behind it or no problem being solved Maybe it doesn't matter to most investors, but like you're saying with Alter Ego's 100-year fund, they're in it for the long haul. So how do you think most investors would answer that? I think most investors go just if you follow the money, right? Most investors follow trends and they look for, you know, exploding trends and an opportunity to be one of the, you know, one of three that make it through the gates, um, which just is very costly. I wrote an email to somebody the other day and they were... It was an investor, a potential. Investor. We're raising money like constantly, it seems, but we don't, I don't let VC money in anymore. We actually asked our one VC to withdraw their funds because it just wasn't, they were playing defense and we were playing offense. Um, yeah. And so we, you know, even though I have a history in finance, I've made money for people, I still have difficulty raising funds because of that, that question's like, you know, I need five years to get this thing really rocking and probably 20 to make it like the global business I think it is. Because again, we're playing in a global commodity. I'm not engineering something for a domestic U.S. endurance athlete or, you know, some trend. I mean, I'm playing in honey. So I used to look for the quick wins. And I think that part of my age, perhaps, um, and you're looking for the big lifts, right? Like if you're looking to create wealth. And you're looking to do it in the fastest way possible, the biggest nut. And now I'm a little older. I don't need every dollar on the table. Like I have a great life as it is. This company could just stay where it's at and I can have an awesome life. I think it has a lot more potential in my daily you know, kind of mantra, if I will, is like, am I being the founder that this company deserves and to take it? Like, like, am I developing enough? Am I getting the right people around us to really maximize the company's potential? It's not even about me anymore. It's like, where can this company go? I'm just like this guy that kind of keeps on the rails. Um, so sitting here today, I would tell you I'd invest 10 out of 10 times in the longer company. Now there's a thousand other considerations. You know, it could be a person with a great idea and shit execution. Probably not going to put my cash there. Like there has to be a blend of offensive and defensive and some protections and being first is just one of many, you know, moats you can put around you. You know, we have patents. We have supply chain. We have partnerships that are exclusive. Um, there's reasons why I can say we're building the first fully independent regenerative source of liquid honey in the U.S. and abroad. It's because I have, you know, pr defensive protections in place that we've been building over four years. So that kind of stuff. Our largest investor outside of myself, he asked me early on, why are you doing all this supply chain stuff? I don't get it. And he's not from the space, from the industry. And now he realizes when I'm able to have a conversation with the executive ranks of major retailers about their pollinator commitment and that if they want to have a company that's really putting their, you know, the money where their mouth is, that they should support past the honey. And we're not doing bottoms up selling anymore. We're doing top down social impact ESG selling 
do the executive ranks down, he gets it and he knows that we can defend. Like if I'm going to create the awareness, we're going to spend all this time and money educating buyers and educating consu consumers. I'm sure as hell going to capture as much of that value we're creating as possible. And that's where you have to think about the strategy. So yes, a long-term mission is great, but what's the strategy and how realistic is that? And I know that certain things aren't realistic today, but like, is there some sort of logic that it can hang on to? Um, you know, when I tell people that, you know, past the honey could be a billion dollar you know, company, they laugh. I'm like, well, Nutella does hazelnuts and they're like seven to eight billion. So like, what do you, I think honey's bigger <laughs> than hazelnuts. Like there's just yeah. dumb, stupid, stupid logic. Like you look at other wonderful pistachios. I think honey is bigger than pistachios. You know, I don't know. Maybe I could be wrong, but like it's a global play. I guess one question I would have for you is knowing where you're at right now, I, th I think you'll just have the one honeycomb product, right? And you're talking about uh, kind of going into retail and figuring out where the retailers fit you in in produce or in specialty or in honey or whatever. But with that said, what is the long term vision? Do you plan to grow past the honey into a billion dollars selling, continuing to sell this one honeycomb product? Or do you envision a whole suite of honey based products that are just more pure, more natural, et cetera? There are four major revenue streams for this company, and that's all I'll get into right now. And it's okay. a global business. I mean, it, it, again, it's a this is a commodities play. It is going yeah. after the $10 billion, 70% fraudulent honey market. Like, that's the question I ask myself when I ask our investors is, if liquid honey is agreeably $10 billion globally, but 70% of it is fraudulent, how undervalued is it? Is it undervalued by 20%? Is it undervalued by five times? I, yeah. We don't know. But if we're out here, you know, again, creating those, those independent, regenerative, unadulterated channels, then we have a good shot at, you know, having a sliver of a very large market. Yeah. And that's not a market saying like people, cause it's Uber, cause everyone, you know, drives or goes somewhere. Like it's not saying that or, it's energy bars because everybody eats a bar. Like it, no, it's like it's honey. It's this is an agreed upon commodity class that is traded on exchanges. We all know what the value of honey is at any given second of the day. That just happens yep. to be it's highly fraudulent. So there's a, there's an argument that it's highly undervalued as well. Yeah. So when you ask about the big vision, like I want past the honey to be the only honey people buy. It's the only honey. The only honey people should buy, sadly, is a honeycomb because yep. I can't even trust liquid honey. So like if I work in the industry and I know all the players or a large portion of them and I couldn't tell you what was good honey or bad. Yeah. I mean, people say, oh, they come to me and say, oh, what about Manuka? I'm like Manuka, great. But if you're a fraudster and 70% of liquid honey is fraudulent, are you going to go knock off the teddy bear that sells for $1.99? Or are you going to go knock off something that, you know, is $80 a cup? Yeah. So Manuka is even more fraudulent than your average honey. <laughs> Yeah. So, and then, oh, but I only buy local honey because the local allergens. I'm like, you're not eating enough of anything locally to get an immunity to it. Like, I don't know how much honey you think you're eating, but, and local honey sadly has a lot of pesticides and car exhaust in it. Like we test for it. That, that six mile radius is really different. We need a minimum of 8,000 acres for our apiaries. That's a yeah. large amount of acreage that can't be downwind from other agricultural uses because the spray drifts. Like we did, we had to look at 13 million acres in the U.S. GIS data, wind patterns. We identified about 3 million acres. We secured a million at point one, so 1.1. 1 .1. And of those 1.1s, we've only found about half a million where we can have apiaries on just because of land, the way the land is, right? Like getting wow. to it. Yeah. So from 13 million to three to one and a half to half a million, you know, we have 10 apiary locations right now on that first half a million acres. That's how difficult it is to, you know, create a supply chain in the U.S. with an item that, with an insect that flies six miles. And we'll wow. go further if it needs to, to find forage. Yeah. So you got to make sure you have your forage, you know, your understory of the, of the, of the forest has enough pollen sources, fuel. Otherwise they're going to fly further. And if they fly further, then it kind of breaks our constraints. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. It's just, yeah. Well, yeah. Part of me was thinking, do you at some point like end up you know, because there's like byproducts sometimes that you make, uh, like um, what was it, farmhouse culture, realized people wanted gut shots of like 
their sauerkraut juice. So they started making more batches of sauerkraut so they can have the juice. And then they had all this leftover sauerkraut and they had to make some chips out of it. But, but in this case, I'm thinking like, you need all this land, all this area to put your, to put your bees on so that the bees can create honey. And part of me was almost thinking, does this end up becoming a land play (laughs) where you end up kind of like McDonald's where you're not actually a restaurant, you're a real estate investor, (laughs) something like that, to where you end up having to like create all your own, I don't know, um, buy, buy land or, or build your own farms where you can have better control over what's planted there. And you do have a better understanding of what the bees are, are tapping to, to make their honey, et cetera. That, that kind of is where my mind started wandering off to. It was like, this problem gets it's, bigger it's, and bigger and bigger. You know, It's being discussed and we have land identified. However, the better play is not just me accumulating land. The better play is that because we need things that are far removed from industrial agriculture, there are communities of people in the U.S. that have been marginalized. Population, entire populations that are so like they're, they're remote, right? And so access becomes a concern and, and jobs and skills and income. But we need those remote places. Yeah. So to be able to bring skills and income to educate, you know, be, new beekeepers to the standards we've developed with UC Davis, these regenerative apiculture standards, to give them a skill and give them an income source and build a processing facility um, in these more remote regions. Like we just happen to have a product that, that requires remoteness. Yeah. So there is a, a human element that I'd much rather promote currently than acquiring land and building things vertically. Yeah. So, I think that is a far better use of our, of our time and has a better impact. Yeah. Yeah. Cause if, if you run out of existing land or existing businesses to partner with, where you can put your apiaries where there's already that human inf- infrastructure where you can reach the, the hives and there's people there to care for them and there's stuff going on on that land uh, for the bees to, to tap into if you can't find enough of that to grow your business to a billion dollars or whatever then it starts coming into a play of uh, do i have to start my own farms do i have to you know whatever to create that supply chain so i can see um, well, that's what we're doing right now globally yeah there's far better forage zones and i mean we we source and well, we source primarily in one country and we are now going to four it looks like hopefully soon but other food systems in other countries are just different. There isn't a monocrop culture in other places, yeah. which means there's less spraying and, le- and there's more forage zone. And a lot of these other regions we're looking at have generational beekeepers. Like it's a cultural thing. Nice. So like oh, the, the neotechnoids, the glyphosates, they're just not used. They've been banned. Um, so yeah, working in a global commodity, again, starts to open the mind up that I'm not constrained with domestic production. I would love to produce it domestically, and we're working on that. But there's also a way to do this in other regions that have better, I'm just going to say, better food systems Yeah. Um, that aren't so extractive, that are actually retentive and, in our case, regenerative. Um, and people don't get the difference between, you know, you know degradive, degradative, or, uh, yeah, degradive, I guess, systems versus sustainable, which is just status quo versus regenerative, which is a, kind of leave it better than you found it situation. And that's what we work in because we have a, a unique product with a unique production that has a very broad footprint with a very little like actual physical footprint. Gotcha. Makes sense. So I know I know you give a lot of Fun. advice already in your book for people thinking about starting a business and you've got those four different archetypes that, that they can choose their own adventure. So whichever one resonates most with them based on their background, they can kind of read specific examples based on that. But based on the new lessons that you're learning <laughs> through Pass the Honey, is there any new advice that didn't make it into the book that you think you could offer to others kind of following in your footsteps? No new advice that's like that's hyper targeted just cuz it is Every little category in the space has its own nuances. Beverage is different than berries. Berries is different than bars. Bars is different than kombuchas or bone broths. Like, there's those. The main thing that I can't stress enough, and actually, this is what we talked about before, is that there's a, there's an emotional toll when you found any company, food or otherwise. And that was the theme in the book that came out at the end that probably didn't get as much topic and ink as it could have. 
is that when we start interviewing, so throughout the book, it, it's not just a, like a, a fable of choose your adventure. There are actual case studies from real, real founders, real brands, you know, Chris Hunter from Koya, uh, Vanessa Dew from Health Aid, the folks from Midday Squares, oh, nice. um, and, and Cassandra Curtis from Once Upon a Farm. Like there's, there's household name brands that are kind of proof pointing, like, Hey, we went through this same thing. This is what happened in my situation. This is what we would do and wouldn't do again. Oh, that's over. cool. So the, the point was, wasn't just to tell a story, a made up story using, you know, characters, but it was to anchor it with real world case studies from brands, you know, and, you know, trust and that you can see on shelves. Cause it is, this isn't a book about me or past the honey. I don't think we're even mentioned in it until the very, very end of like the acknowledgements. Hmm. It's really about the commonalities we all face as a founder, you know, population in consumer goods. But that, that toll, there was a couple takeaways in some of the interviews at the end where one founder, her mother made her a spreadsheet. I mentioned this to you earlier. Her mother made her a spreadsheet of all her lost wages that she was going to give up if she let go of her career to follow this, this founding <laughs> of this food company, beverage company in this case. Like, your mother is making a spreadsheet telling you you're making dumb ideas and you still push through. Um, dating as a founder, if you're single without the support system is brutal because you don't know what your days look like. Um, finding a partner and that is, you know, your priorities are different. You, you have other people's salaries depending on you. Um, one founder was saying that his, you know, he's 20 something living in Chicago and his friends are going to the beach every weekend and he had to get into QuickBooks and like pay bills. And that's just, what he had to do. So he missed, you know, his twenties, you know, his party years, if you will. Um, you know, you don't think about rest and meditation and, you know, wellness of your own self when you're in your early twenties, founding a company of any nature. And it's even more ironic when you're in a wellness, you know, play, <laughs> CPG, like yeah. your own health gets compromised, your own mental sanity gets compromised, but here you are sacrificing for the wellness of others through your product. So that's the stuff that you know, just be aware be aware that there's an emotional toll, a financial toll, a family toll, friendship toll. You lose friends. A lot of friends don't understand what you're yeah. doing. Um, that was a common, common thing. Husbands, wives, don't get what you're doing. You're using family money now all of a sudden. Like, yep. Those are the tough conversations that I have mad admiration for is when one of the founders in the book used, I think it was like $5,000 to get her first like sample run made or packaging run. That's what it was. And her husband was not stoked. And now, in hindsight, it was the best, you know, $5,000 it was spent. But at the time, like, those are real trade-offs. Like, you know, we have a family savings account and our, our daughters and sons, you know, are, you know, we have to provide for them, these little mouths. And you're diverting it to this, like, weird idea. And sometimes those weird ideas don't pan out. 80-something percent of the time, they yeah. don't. This one worked out well. But, like, that is, that's a toll on a relationship. Yeah. So that's the stuff that I don't think people talk about and that came out towards the end was the real commonality was the human component of starting a food company, not the technical, which is like really where the choose your own path comes in as more technical decision making. Yeah, absolutely. I think we wrote an article on our website, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago or something about the, like, the toll that entrepreneurism or like running a business takes or has on a, a relationship, you know. In this particular case, we were talking about the number of divorces we've seen largely due to the fact that like a oh. business was started. And maybe in the beginning, there's like a supportive nature between, you know, the entrepreneur and the, the other partner in the relationship. But at some point, you know, like that other partner is going to get tired of their entrepreneur counterpart working all sorts of crazy hours, spending all the family money, like burning through the kids college, fund, you know, whatever it is yeah. with like you said, no guarantee of success. Running a business is almost the opposite of a guarantee of success. You're most likely to fail, right? So they're seeing all that time, all that money, all that effort poured into it. And it almost becomes like a separate relationship. Like now this entrepreneur is dating their business <laughs> and their spouse starts, starts getting jealous, yeah. you know, and then they start getting angry and then they start getting resentful. And the next thing you know, either, you know, there needs to become like a, a moment where they, the other spouse says, you know what, <laughs> this is scary, but I'm all in with you. I'm going to support this and like makes that change of mindset or those, that partnership will kind of end, you know, and I've seen that, that end of the partnership so many times or the end of the business because they didn't want to give up the partnership. So it is, it takes a huge toll, um, on relationships for sure. But then I think it's, 
the way you were just describing that, I could see So You Wanna becoming like a whole series of books. <laughs> kind of like, So You Wanna Date a Founder <laughs> or So You Wanna yeah. Support Your Spouse Who's an Entrepreneur yeah. or something like that. And creating like the how-to manuals. Oh, it's got, it's got some legs. <laughs> yeah. <Next thing. laughs> and none of them have yeah. answers. That's the part that people, I, there's a woman in that cohort here and she's like, oh, I picked up your book. And I was like, hey, here's your spoiler alert. There's no right answer. <laughs> like, don't look to the book for answers. It's, it just gives you a, a, a broader lens to look at the yeah. landscape from and some waypoints on maybe where you want to take your business. But it is, I didn't, we were, when I was first approached to write this, it was this, like, I, I think you should write a definitive guide to starting a food company. I was like, no, I, I don't believe there's any one way to do that. I think there's a thousand ways to you know, start a business. And the ones that make the most sense later never made the most sense early on. So I'm no expert. And then it was like, well, we need you to write a how you did this. I'm like, what have I done yet? Like, I'm, I'm still figuring things out. Like, I don't think I'll ever stop figuring things out. Like, so it was really when the publisher asked me, well, what word did you buy? And I was like, I think business is like a choose your own adventure book. Like, you're making partial decisions with partial information to the best of your ability yeah. day in and day out. And if we could write a choose your own adventure business book, I think that's more reflective of a real business, you know, how to than anything else. And that was kind of where our light bulb went off. I was like, this is interesting. Nobody's really done this. And I don't know. Again, it's, it's accountability. It's retention. I yeah. think people, if they choose a path, they'll retain information more. Well, it helps them um, understand what they're about to get into, right? Because it's going to be a difficult path and they've got to have resilience. Yeah. And if, if they can understand that ahead of time, sure. they get to consciously make the decision whether or not to move forward. Because a lot of people, yeah. once they read the list of, here's all the things you're going to have to think about when you if you want to become an entrepreneur, most people are going to read that list and say, mm, never mind, <laughs> it sounded fun, but the reality is crazy. It's but if you go funny. forward anyway, now you're better prepared and you're more resilient, hopefully. So... With what you just said and what we were talking about just before us about spousal support yeah. or lack thereof, I had a number of spouses reach out to me and say, I gave this to my spouse to talk them out of doing what they were going to do. <laughs> and I was like, oh, well, that wasn't really the intention of the book. <laughs> but in a way, like, make sure you're committed to your point. Yeah. Like, if you're going to go in, this is what you may or may not experience. And it's not just me saying it. It's not just a made up story. You have a dozen other founders saying the same thing. We're all in the same boat. Yeah. No matter how smart you think you are, or how much experience you have, you know, veterans make mistakes too. You know, a playbook that worked, hell, the playbook that worked five years ago does not work today. Yeah. And that is like with all the strains on the supply chain and everything else. And the just, playbook that works for no. one person doesn't necessarily work for someone else because that person yeah. has their own network of connections they have access to yeah. capital they have skill sets or or uh, internal motivations that you don't have there's like a whole or just a different desire yeah exactly Some people want to go to the farmer's market and talk to people all day that's not me yeah that, that, that <laughs> is a people. nightmare for me but like my mom would love to start a business and just be at the farmer's market and just chat everybody up she's a chatty kathy yeah love her to death like that's that would that would make her life full and it would drain me. So to your point about different times, different access, different desire, different outcomes. And that's where knowing your end game and building backwards is probably the best advice I can give any founder is just, yeah. do you want to challenge Pepsi? It's a different path than do you want to talk to people on a Sunday? Like those are different business models with different capital needs and different decision making. Just know what you want to do or get as clear as you can of where you want to go and know that it will twist and turn. But yeah. I know I want to go after the global honey supply. So we are building this company differently than if I just want to make a quick buck. There's far better ways to make a quick buck than what I'm doing right now. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Yeah. I feel like that goes with a, a <laughs> totally. I feel like that's a, a lot of small <laughs> businesses, right? Um, initially, most small businesses are probably more people designing their ideal job than they are designing a business. Yep. They're just figuring out how to do the things they're either good at or love doing for money. But there comes a time where you have to make a decision like, do I want to keep like having this lifestyle business or do I actually want to create a scalable business? And that's a whole different kind of can I, um, challenge, right? The term lifestyle business, can we talk about that for a second? Sure. I'm putting things in play on a global level in a large commodity class um, with a very broad distribution footprint. It's my life and it is a lifestyle I'm creating. And I don't, but I, you can have big businesses and have it be a lifestyle. I'm sure you know, the founder of Patagonia has a lifestyle. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Social, you know, like 
I don't know. I that that maybe term maybe like a hobby out. business. I don't know. There, there's because I, I see what you're saying. There's like you can yeah. have a business and a good lifestyle if you design it right. But I think the trick is if you don't design the business, then all you have is the the job that you wanted to create for yourself. Okay. And if you're not working on actual systems and processes, scalable models and things that you can like hand off to someone else so you can take a vacation, then you just have the the lifestyle part of the hobby business or whatever. So yeah, I don't think the lifestyle business is the right term for it, but I think there's a big difference between someone who's, you know, trading dollars for hours versus someone who's building a system that uh, can work without them, right? It's kind of like the e- uh, e-myth revisited yeah, e-myth. book or yeah. like um, different kind of models like that where you're actually building something that functions outside of you. Whereas I think a lot of early entrepreneurs, they build something that's centered around them. And if they take themselves yes. out of it, the whole thing crumbles. And that's why they work themselves to death is because they didn't build a system. They didn't design an actual business. So you're building they designed a death a job. system <laughs> or a business system. <laughs> yeah. Are you designing a job or a business? And I think that's where a lot of... Yeah new entrepreneurs or small business entrepreneurs get stuck. Like I went through the 10,000 small businesses program, which is like a growth accelerator for small businesses. Yeah. And in that, they're just like is pound it you. It is. Uh, I mean, it stumbled a little bit through COVID, but there's still okay. at least the community. And I think they might've yeah. restarted some of the program, but, but they like in that program, they're just pounding you over and over again. Like if there's one phrase you take away from that whole program is um, work, on the business, not in the business. And that's kind of the idea of like, you got to design a system that can live and function without you so that you can have a life and you can exit from it at some point and it's not going to crumble. Love it. Yeah. So no more use of lifestyle business. Yeah. Well, we'll, let's, we'll come up with a different term and then you can write another book on that. Are you designing a job (laughs) or are you designing a business? Like, are you creating a job for yourself or are you creating a business? Like that, that's a very good delineation because there are plenty of, you know, personality driven businesses that are, you know, jobs for the individual. Yeah. Like you said, if somebody really right? wants like to go job. chat people up at a farmer's market, it's probably not a business because you're the one that wants to chat people up at the business market. Yeah. Therefore, you're going to bottleneck the business and you're not going to be able to scale it. Um, but if you just love the idea of selling a product at farmer's markets and you can train 100 people to chat people up at farmer's markets, because you got the right systems and processes in place, then you know maybe you're talking about an actual business instead of a job. I like it. <laughs> well, I dig it. Thank you for exploring that with me. It's always because yeah. as an investor, right, early on, and I was a young investor, like I was what twenty nine, thirty, something like that. You're like, oh, that's a lifestyle business. That's not something we can invest in. It's like what a shitty thing to tell someone. Yeah, and what a just dismissive statement. And I had to tell somebody probably two months ago, like, I have a lifestyle business too. It just happens to be really large because my lifestyle wants to be large. Like, I don't know what you're talking about a lifestyle business. Like, <laughs> this is my life's work. Yeah. I just told you that like an hour ago. So how is this not a lifestyle business if it's my life's work? <laughs> yeah. Um, Maybe yeah. it's like a lifestyle business versus a business that affords me my lifestyle. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> we'll, keep, right. we'll keep playing with it. Yeah, but I appreciate it. But in the meantime, I feel like hole. I've... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I feel like I've kept you longer than intended. It was a fun conversation, but uh, just, you know, thanks for sparing some time to share some uh, of your background, your story, a little bit of about your book and your business, Pass the Honey. We'll put some links to all those things in the show notes. Um, thanks for doing what you do and sharing your story and being on the mission driven path. I appreciate it. Gage, I appreciate you and uh, welcome me on and keep doing your good work over at Modern Species and here. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers. Thanks for listening. If you'd like to learn more about Douglas or Pass the Honey, go to PassTheHoney.com. Subscribe to our podcast and YouTube channel for more innovator interviews, expert advice, and leadership discussions. If you like this episode, leave a heart, thumbs up, or review and share it with your colleagues. As an ever-evolving show, we also love feedback, so send us your thoughts or ideas for who we should talk to next to evolve at modernspecies.com.